Second Samuel in your Bibles, please. This is the book sermon on Second Samuel, which means uh, you have a couple of choices. You can either flip with me through Second Samuel, or there are those outlines on the back table. Uh, for the book of 2 Samuel, I make a point of giving you a homegrown outline with every book that I preach. And so there's that outline. Um, this one has um, 2 Samuel. It also corresponds all of the places in 1 Chronicles where we see um, parallel passages. And then it has a little bit of a, I guess you could say a, a very primitive timeline as to particularly tracing David's triumphs until his sin and then his, his troubles after that. And then on the back page I give you, which some of you have already, the, the covenants of Scripture. We're going to be coming into that um, very much particularly as we get into 2 Samuel 7 and understanding some of the covenants that are found in the Word of God. Coming off of the heels of our time in 1 Samuel in the morning service, today we have the privilege of continuing our series in the evening by entering into 2 Samuel. Now it will be a major benefit to us that we've just gone through 1 Samuel because really it's just a continuation of the narrative. In fact, as you look into um, the Hebrew Old Testament, this is one book. Uh, this is not even two books. So, so we, we have the split, but at the same time, we're, we're talking about one narrative here. And it literally picks up right where we left off in 1 Samuel 31. So we, it's going to be a great benefit to us that we just continue here in the narrative of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is one of the most important books in our Bible. That sounds a little strange, perhaps, to say as maybe you're, you're not even familiar with a lot of the things that happen in 2 Samuel. How could it be one of the most important books in our Bible? But in 2 Samuel, we, have, we learn about the reign of David over Israel. David is without question the most important king in Israel's history. And the life and rule of King David not only establishes the tone for the next several hundred years of the monarchy. But through David's reign, we find the promise, the template, and the hope of God's kingdom program through Messiah. We spoke several weeks ago in the morning service just briefly about God's program and the reality that all which God is doing in the world is pointing toward the establishment of His kingdom. We, have, we understood his right to rule. We understand uh, that he, he is seeking a people over which to rule. We understand there's coming a day when he will exercise his authority to rule. Second Samuel gives us one of the most consequential pieces of God's kingdom program as he establishes his purpose to work through the lineage of David. And as we enter into the New Testament, the fact that Jesus is of the house and lineage of David is essential to establishing his right as God's king, his right to be Messiah, and it's essential for establishing the template of his kingdom. The promises of God to David in 2 Samuel for, uh, form the very basis for how we understand God's covenants and God's kingdom program. Now, throughout the course of this book, we'll find ourselves regularly in 1 Chronicles as well. This book gives us many parallel accounts to the life of David, and some of them from, from unique and different perspectives. You can see, as I mentioned already, the cross-references um, on, on your outline to 1 Chronicles, and we'll reference those as we come to those in the text. We'll also reference a few more psalms. You'll also find those on your outline. If you're walking through the outline, you'll find bracketed from time to time a psalm. And that psalm was written during the events, or at least pertaining unto the, the events of that particular chapter of Scripture or that particular passage. So, Lord willing, that'll be a help to you as well. Now, by the time this book is finished we will have considered the majority of David's life. And I would encourage you to read through all of David's psalms, 
with a newfound knowledge at some point of his life. Considering even the ones that he doesn't attribute to a particular time. You know, we have the Psalms that he wrote in the caves. And we have the Psalm that he wrote after he learned about Doeg and Doeg's wickedness. And we have the Psalms that he wrote um, as the lament. We have, we have the lamentation of, of Saul and of Jonathan. We have all of these Psalms that he wrote in particular instances. But we also have a great deal of Psalms of David that just don't really have a, a particular event. And yet, knowing David's life as intimately as we will, it's going to give you a brand new appreciation. It's going to add a, a new flavor to the Psalms of David when you read them. As you consider his life and his character and his heart before the Lord. Now the book opens, Second Samuel opens with the aftermath of the battle in which Saul and his sons were killed. While David remained in Ziklag, he, he is told of the death of Jonathan and the death of Saul. He's given proof that the report was true. Knowing what we do about David's own emotional turmoil that he had just gone through, right? He had just lost his family, then retrieved it again. He, his, his men wanted to stone him at one point, and he had to encourage himself in the Lord. Knowing all of the emotional turmoil he had just been in, you can imagine how it must have affected him when he heard that Saul and Jonathan were dead and that Israel was smitten before the Philistines. So David laments the death of Saul and Jonathan, calling them the beauty of Israel, the mighty who had fallen. In this, David reflects the same kind of humble and submissive heart that he had in life, uh, in, in Saul's life, even in Saul's death. He didn't rejoice over the death of those who had made themselves his enemies. And that really comprises all of chapter 1 of 2 Samuel. 1 through 16 being the, the account of Saul's death. 17 and following being the lamentation of Saul's death. And Jonathan's, of course. Now, though David mourned for Saul and Jonathan, he also understood full well that this meant the primary threat to his life was now gone. And the primary contention against his throne was now gone as well. So he inquired of the Lord. He, he sought the Lord first of all. And he asked God what he should do. Whether or not he should go up to Israel. And specifically whether or not he should go up to Judah. Now God answers him, the scriptures tell us. And answers him affirmatively. That yes, indeed he should go up to Hebron. That which is a city in Judah. And as soon as he went up. As soon as he went up to Hebron. The, the text tells us that the men of Judah met him and they immediately anointed him king over Judah. Now, it's important to mention here that it was just over the house of Judah that David was anointed king. That his kinsmen, the Judites, aligned themselves with him, acknowledged God's, God's anointing upon, upon him, but not all Israel anointed him on this day. In fact, we find that in, within this context comes the first true focus of 2 Samuel, the next phase of David's life, a seven and a half year phase where David was only king over Judah. And in fact, he was at war with the house of Saul during this time. For seven and a half years, the house of David in Hebron and the, the tribe of Judah would fight the nation of Israel and the house of Saul. For these seven and a half years, David is king only over the tribe of Judah and his capital for that time is Hebron. Well, we find in 2 Samuel 2.8 that Abner, on the contrary, who was captain of Saul's military and we'll find out as well, or we know as well, that Abner is also Saul's uncle, took Saul's surviving son, named Ishbosheth, and made him king over the tribes of Israel. So Abner, Saul's uncle, takes Ishbosheth after Saul dies and Jonathan dies and the other two brothers die. And he says, Ishbosheth is now king, and Israel is following Ishbosheth. Between family loyalties and natural expectation of succession, this would not have been an unexpected turn of events, right? 
2 Samuel 2 verse 12 recounts the first skirmish between David's men, led by a man named Joab as well as his brothers, Abishai and Azahel, and Ishbosheth's men, led by Abner. This skirmish left men dead on both sides, with Abner and his men, so Saul's men, Ishbosheth's men, being soundly defeated. Now Abner flees from this battle, and the scriptures tell us that Joab's brother Azahel flees after him. And uh, we'll get, when, when we get there, we'll see how it works out. But during this chase, Abner kills Joab's brother Azahel, and the men depart to their respective camps. So now Joab's brother Azahel is dead. Abner has been defeated. Abner is still alive. We fast forward now to the end of David's seven and a half year reign over the nation. We find ourselves in 2 Samuel 3. Ishbosheth and Abner have a falling out. And Abner comes to terms with David for a truce. Abner comes to David, he says, I'm willing to do a truce. David says, it sounds good to me. And they form a truce. Now, this is, this is years after the initial skirmish. Fighting has happened for some time now. We don't exactly know how long, but it's quite possible that the fighting has been going on for, for, for seven years, for several years at least at this point. Joab, hearing that Abner, his brother's killer, is in a league with David, calls Abner and betrays him and kills him. Joab kills Abner, he murders him. And when David hears this, he's extremely distressed by this development. And in fact, he curses Joab. And he says, the blood of this man is not on my kingdom, the blood of this man is on Joab alone. David is not the only one distressed, however. Ishbosheth and all of Israel were greatly troubled by this. There was this league between Abner and David. Now Abner is dead. There's, there's no leadership in the military. Ishbosheth was always kind of just a, a, a kind of a, a puppet leader, it seems, the way he, the way he lived and the way he ruled. Uh, Abner's death brought the nation into great uncertainty. And so within this uncertainty, the scriptures tell us that Ishbosheth has a couple other captains, and they decide that they're going to hedge their bets. Seeing the direction things were going, recognizing that David had already been prevailing, and now Abner is dead, and Abner had already struck a truce with David anyway, and things were not going well for Ishbosheth, they decide that they're going to seek to gain David's favor by killing Ishbosheth. And they do so. They kill him. They behead him, and they take the head of Ishbosheth to David. Now, David was very, very angry at them for this treachery. It's one of those funny things. When, when, you, uh, when you see this happening in, in, in history, in the history books, people uh, killing each other and trying to gain favor with each other through these things, there's this pagan allure to the idea that this man killed my enemy, so now he's my friend. And yet, when a righteous man looks at that, he says, if this man was willing to kill my enemy, who was his friend, now he's my friend, how soon before he kills me, right? And so, David, uh, now David is incensed because of their treachery. And he destroys them for it. And then he takes Ishbosheth and he buries him in his great uncle Abner's tomb. So David's struggle ends with the house of Saul in 2 Samuel 4. A struggle which had begun, the, the struggle with the house of Saul, had begun all the way back in 1 Samuel 21. And beginning in 2 Samuel 5, the account of David's 33-year reign over the entire nation of Israel begins with his anointing in Hebron by all the tribes of Israel. So for seven and a half years, he reigned only over Judah as he was still contending against the house of Saul. And now, in 2 Samuel 5, we finally see him reigning over all of Israel. Can you imagine? How many years was David waiting between his anointing and the time where he actually saw the fulfillment of those promises? David is a patient man, but he has finally found that success. Now, one of David's first acts as king was to establish a capital for his kingdom. Now, we know that Saul was in Gibeah. His capital at the time had been in Hebron. Hebron. 
But he chooses for the capital of Israel, Jerusalem. And up until this point, Jerusalem had not been in the hands of Israel. All the way back to the time of Canaan, we find that the, that, that the nation of Israel had never been successful at driving the inhabitants of Jerusalem out. So the Jebusites, to that day, still lived in Jerusalem. Now the name of the mountain upon which Jerusalem rested was a mountain called Zion. And the name of the city, Jerusalem, when David took it, would become known as the city of David. Or... Mount Zion. David establishes himself in this city, and he establishes himself in his kingdom. He wages battle, the text tells us, directed by God against the Philistines, taking back the land that had long belonged to Israel by God's promise, and finding success in every endeavor. Everywhere he turned, he sought the Lord, the Lord answered him, he did it. He asked the Lord, the Lord answered him, he did it. And he was living in this this string of success that was rooted in his obedience to the Lord. As David's success grew, he developed a deeper urge to have a relationship with God. He developed a desire to have God nearer, to have God closer. So he took the initiative to locate the Ark of the Covenant, which from this point had been really out of the picture since very early in the book of 1 Samuel, right? Since the days when, when uh, Samuel's sons took it to the battlefield with the Philistines and the Philistines captured it and then all the plagues happened to them so they sent it back on a cart and it's been living ever since just in the outskirts of Israel. And 2 Samuel 6 is the record of this retrieval which didn't go quite as David had planned it. Somewhere along the line, David had become a bit too comfortable with God. And in his haste for the ark, in his haste to get it and to bring it back to Jerusalem, he did not follow God's instructions on how to transport it. And at one point, as the ark was heading back, the scriptures tell us it was shaken off the cart and it was going to fall. And a man named Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark. And the scriptures tell us that the moment he touched the Ark of the Covenant, he was killed by God's holy wrath and his righteousness. Now David is greatly troubled by this. He's greatly troubled by the action. He's greatly troubled by, by he's fearful of God's holiness. So he doesn't ret finish retrieving the Ark, and it would actually be another six months before he felt comfortable finishing the job and bringing the Ark of God to Jerusalem, which eventually he did to much fanfare. And that's what we find in 2 Samuel 6, is the retrieval of that Ark. And this brings us to 2 Samuel 7. And if you look on your, um, your little timeline, your um, primitive timeline, you'll notice that chapter 7 comprises what's called the Davidic Covenant, the pinnacle of David's kingdom. David is successful at every turn. He's in his house. He's at rest from his enemies. This is the closest Israel would ever come to the covenant promises of God within David's lifetime. And it is at this time that David is sitting in his house at rest. And he decides he wants to build a place of rest for God. He wants to build a permanent place for God. I've got a house. I want God to have a house. Now initially he tells the prophet Nathan this, and Nathan says, do what is in your heart, go and do it. But very soon, in fact immediately after that, God tells Nathan, you need to go back to David, and you need to tell him something. You need to tell him that I will not allow him to build this house, because he was a man of war. However, God uses this opportunity to establish a covenant with David. He says, David, you don't get this privilege, but here's the thing. Uh, you wanted to build me a house. Here's my promise to you. I'm going to build you a house. Not a house of cedars, not a house like the one he was sitting in. A household is what God meant there. I'm going to build you a house, he says. And God establishes this covenant with David, promising to build his family, establish it, as the kingly family in Israel for all eternity, that as long as Israel existed, there would not fail to be a king from David's line on the throne. 
He promised that there would never cease to be a son from the lineage of David upon the throne. And, and he promises that David's heir, should his heir obey the Lord, would be blessed and would be allowed to build God's temple. David spends verses 18 through 29 of chapter 7 praising the Lord. And this chapter has become one of the most theologically significant chapters in the entirety of the scriptural record for what it teaches us about God's plan through Messiah. Now over the next three chapters we see a further record of David's obedience and David's success. In chapter 8, David continues to subdue the Philistines and also the Syrians. He begins to receive tribute from kings. He subdues the Edomites. So, so the, things are just going great. The Philistines have fled from him. Kings are coming and giving him gifts just to get on his good side. The Edomites have been subdued and he's put captains uh, in Edom. It's truly a blessed time for David's reign. In chapter 9, David seeks out Jonathan's lineage. Remember when Jonathan and David made the covenants? And Jonathan told David, will you swear to me when you become king that you will do good to my household? That you will be kind to my household? That you will bless me and my sons? And David said, I swear it, Jonathan. And so David begins to make good on those covenants he made with Jonathan. Fulfills the promises to care for, for Jonathan that he made uh, when, before he was king. And so... David finds one of Jonathan's sons, a man named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth had been lame from an accident. He had been dropped as a child and been paralyzed in his legs. So he was lame. And he was blessed by David. He was effectively brought into David's family. He was effectively made royalty as David seeks to fulfill his promises to Jonathan. In, in chapter 10, David is sorely mistreated by the Ammonites. David sends an envoy to, to the Ammonites um, to comfort the king because his father had just died. And his father, the previous king, had been a good friend of David's. And so he sends this envoy and the foolish young king thinks that David is seeking to, to uh, send spies into the land. And so the king sends these men back disgraced. And David is very angry. Ammon sees that he got on David's bad side, and so he seeks the king of Syria. And they come together to defend themselves against David, but it's all for naught. David subdues Ammon. He also subdues the Syrian confederates. And it is during this war that the entire course of David's life would turn. In a string of very bad decisions, it would bring about extreme consequences that will follow him for the rest of his life. While Joab is off fighting the Ammonites, the Bible says during the time when kings went out to battle, David chose rather to stay in Jerusalem. Joab is out fighting the battles of the king, and David stays in Jerusalem. And we read in 2 Samuel 11 that David was upon his roof in the evening when he saw a woman, her name Bathsheba, and he saw her bathing. And so obviously he saw her without clothes on, and he lusted after her. And the scriptures tell us that he took her and he committed adultery with her. Now that evening, the scriptures tell us that Bathsheba conceived. She got pregnant and now she's pregnant with David's child. Well, David, in a desperate attempt to cover his own sin, calls her husband back from war and in doing so, hoping that, that he would lay with his wife and then there could be uh, a matter of concealment as to the true identity of this child's father. But Bathsheba's wife, named Uriah, being a man of great honor, would not do so. And at David's every attempt to conceal his sin, we find that he was thwarted. He's desperately trying to conceal his sin and he's thwarted at every turn. But sin has a way of snowballing, doesn't it? It starts out small, kind of like a snowball, but then if, if, as it rolls, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And rather than humble himself and admit his wrong, David seeks to conceal his sin with more sin. 
He, he chooses rather to preserve his image than to admit to his fault. And so he commands Joab to abandon Uriah in the midst of a battle, thus effectively dooming him to death. Joab is obedient. Uriah is abandoned during the battle. And David becomes guilty of murder. After hearing of Uriah's death, David takes Bathsheba, marries her, and she becomes his wife, one of his wives, right? Chapter 12 records the beginning of David's consequences for these choices that he made. He's confronted by Nathan the prophet, at which point David recognizes his sin. He repents of his sin. He confesses his sin to God. He gets it right, and Nathan says, God has forgiven you. However, repentance doesn't remove consequences, does it? Just uh, confessing our sin before God doesn't inherently remove the consequences of our sin. And the consequences of David's sin were great. Nathan says this. He says, first, because of this sin, you, the sword will never depart from your household, David. He would never be at rest again. Remember that time where he was at rest and he says, I want to build God a house? He would never find that time of rest again. The sword would never depart from his household. Second, evil would rise up against him from his own household. One of his children would rebel against him and against the Lord. Finally, the child of the adulterous relationship with Bathsheba would die as a testimony of David's sin to the nations. We'll talk about this when we get there. Why did this child have to die and how is that right? We'll talk about that. But that, that child would have to die. Now, David's son is born and he is very ill. And all the while that his son is still alive, David is mourning and he's pleading with God not to take this child. But the child does indeed die. The scriptures tell us that David, recognizing that the Lord is just, got up, worshipped the Lord, and moved on. And the scriptures tell us he comforted his wife Bathsheba, and the next record that we have is that Bathsheba bears another son. That son's name is Solomon. And Solomon, the scriptures tell us, was a young man that was greatly beloved of the Lord. So much so that he was given a, a name by Nathan the prophet. A nickname, as it were. The name Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord. Beloved of Jehovah. And this child would eventually become the next king of Israel. And as far as power and strength is concerned, the greatest of Israel's kings. A tale of grace and of mercy on God's part. Now from this point on, David's life and family is very bleak. It's kind of ugly from this point on. The first 11 chapters of 2 Samuel are going to be enjoyable. Well, first 10 going to be enjoyable as we hear of God, God blessing David and David living in the blessing of the Lord. From 11 and onward, it's going to get ugly. Chapter 13, we read of David's son Amnon. He rapes his half-sister Tamar, and David does nothing to punish Amnon for it. And this enrages Tamar's full brother Absalom, both all of these children of David. Absalom lived with this resentment for two years, the scriptures tell us, biding his time after which he ends up killing Amnon. And he kills, he murders him for the rape of his sister. And then he flees the kingdom. Now David is angry. He's angry at Absalom for killing um, Amnon. He's the whole situation is just a mess, and David is very angry about it. He actually banishes. Absalom from the kingdom. But after the passing of time, we read that Absalom is restored. And he's restored through the initiative of Joab, David's captain. At this time, we learn more of Absalom himself. And we find out that Absalom was a man not just who was strong, but he was extremely handsome. He was extremely capable. He was extremely charismatic. And this was just the kind of guy that everyone wants to like. Everyone wants to follow. Uh, he's... Got everything. And so Absalom is restored back to the kingdom 
And several years later, another two years later, David would finally admit Absalom back into his presence. So think of the mess that David's family has been in since the time of his sin. Uh, his son rapes his daughter. Then his other son kills the son that raped his daughter for raping his daughter. Now that son is brought back into the kingdom. And during this time, the same resentment that Absalom has always had is still there. And now it's not just directed against, obviously, Amnon, who's dead, but against David as well. And in chapter 15, we, we find that a Absalom sought to steal the heart of Israel away from David. And he did it. And he did a good job. And in chapter 15, Absalom stages a coup. Uh, and he declares himself king. And he declares himself king in Hebron, the very place where David first became king. And the vast majority of the nation followed Absalom in his treachery. Now David, because of this, is forced to flee. He's forced to flee his home. He's forced to flee his capital. He's forced to flee the temple. But David is not friendless in his flight. The high priest becomes his informant and his ally in the land. David's counselor, Hushai, goes back to entreat the favor of Absalom, goes back to become a double agent, as it were, for David. And the purpose that he went back is to frustrate the counsel of Absalom's counselor, Ahithophel. However, David is still forced to leave the city in shame and dishonor. And he is leaving in defeat. Something which shouldn't happen to one who is walking with the Lord. In chapter 16, we read of these shames. Ziba, Mephibosheth's servant, deceives David. Shimei, a man of Saul's house, curses David to his face. David restrains himself from anger, recognizing that he's suffering the consequences of his own poor choices. And that, that the shame that he is receiving is the reproach of the consequences of his sin years prior. So David is deeply humbled by these events. But all hope is not lost. Hushai, David's friend and counselor, is successful in thwarting the counsel of Ahithophel. In fact, if Absalom had listened to Ahithophel, David probably would have been killed. But the Lord was gracious to David. Hushai's advice was accepted over Ahithophel's advice. And we find in chapter 17 that the tide begins to turn back in David's favor. Ahithophel's counsel is disregarded, Hushai's counsel is obeyed, and David receives provision from his supporters, and so he begins to amass a resistance against Absalom, and they actually put together an army. So now we're going to have a battle between Absalom and the nation of Israel against David and this resistance force. Uh, this resistance force, we find in chapter 18, that it soundly defeats Absalom. And it reclaims the nation of Israel for David. During the battle, David says, don't kill my son. If you find my son, I want him alive. Joab, once again, takes it upon himself to alter David's orders. And he murders Absalom. Remember, Joab is the same one that, that killed Abner after Abner got into a treaty with David. And now David says, don't kill Absalom. And Joab takes it upon himself to murder Absalom as well. Now it did end Absalom's rebellion. But David was crushed by the reports that his son had been killed. And he mourns for Absalom deeply, so deeply in fact that Joab has to rebuke David and say, hey look, your men are coming back from fighting your battle and you haven't even regarded them because you're so busy crying for the one who was trying to kill you that you haven't even, you haven't even observed or, or congratulated or thanked the men that fought for you. So David has to reorient himself a little bit here as he reestablishes his kingdom. We read about that in chapter 19. David pardoned Shimei, the man who cursed him, as well as Mephibosheth, who chose not to follow David when he fled Jerusalem. He rewards those that were faithful to him. 
But there's also a quarrel that arises against Judah. Who are not as hasty to restore David as the other tribes were. This conflict caused another division. And a man named Sheba of Benjamin begins a rebellion against the house of David and seeks to divide the kingdom. David sends a man named Amasa who had been Absalom's captain. Okay, so this is the man that had followed Absalom. Amasa gets himself right with David and David says, okay, now that you're right with me, go and fight this battle for me. Put down this rebellion. Well, here we are. David's acceptance of Amasa instead of condemning him to death, makes Joab really angry. So what does Joab do? Take a guess. He deceives, and he kills Amasa. For the third time in the book, Joab has killed someone the king did not want killed. He reveals an inward heart of rebellion toward his authority, though his actions were, by his perception, in the best interests of David. Now following Amasa's death, Joab finishes the job he was sent to do, Sheba is killed. That insurrection is put down. In chapter 21, we read of famine in the land. This famine, the Bible tells us, is brought by God as a result of the sin committed by King Saul against the Gibeonites. We trace the Gibeonites all the way back to the days of Joshua and the land of Canaan, right? They go into the land of Canaan and there's this group of men called the Gibeonites who said they were from a far country and wanted to make a truce with Israel. Joshua doesn't inquire of the Lord. Instead, he just looks at the physical evidence before him. He says, okay, this will work. And he makes this truce only to find out that they were in fact Canaanites. And so Israel could not kill them now because they, were, they, they had a covenant with Israel. And they were in fact brought into Israel and they were made servants of the, the temple, the tabernacle. Saul had slain the Gibeonites, those that had a covenant with Israel. And God had not forgotten this offense and expected David to make restitution. David does so, the scriptures tell us, and God removes the curse. Now, though things have gone ill for David, he knows these circumstances to be just the outworking of the consequences of David's own sin. So in chapter 22 in its entirety, we find a psalm of praise. A psalm of praise unto God. This chapter is repeated in our Bibles in Psalm 18. And it's almost like an oasis. All of the trouble from chapters 11 through chapter 21 and then, in the midst of all of these trials and tribulations that David has gone through, he writes this beautiful psalm of praise to God. Praising him in the midst of these things. Why? Because God, David knows something. David knows that even though things have been tough, and even though he hasn't done right all the time, and even though he's suffering the consequences of his own sin, God is faithful. And that it hasn't been God that's been the problem. It's been himself. And that even through all of that, David's still king. God's still been faithful to him. Now chapter 23 records the final words of David, the scriptures tell us. The record of David goes beyond this point, And yet apparently these are indeed his final words. Words of humility that seek to justify God and his goodness and his wisdom. Beginning in verse 8 through to the end of the chapter, we read an accounting of David's mighty men. The men who were most faithful and who served him with distinction. In 2 Samuel 23, we, we read of 37 mighty men in all. And the final name on that list of mighty men. One of David's valiant men. One of David's faithful men. One of David's most loyal men. The final name of those 37 in, for, in 2 Samuel 23 is a man named Uriah the Hittite. The man that David murdered to cover his sin. Interesting, is it not? Not, not only was Uriah a man in his military, not only was Uriah a man of great honor 
But Uriah was one of David's mighty men. One of those 37 men of distinction that David murdered in order to try to conceal his sin. While chapter 23 records David's final words, there is one more chapter to the book, and there's even more accounting of David's final days in the books of 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles. The final account in 2 Samuel, however, is, is pretty fitting. It records another one of David's failures. It records another one of the events, the, the negative fallout from David's sin, uh, sinful choices. In 2 Samuel 24, David chooses to, to number the people rather than trust God that regardless of the numbers, God would be able to prevail against his enemies. We'll talk about this when we get here. Why was it a sin for David to number the people? And what exactly was the sin that was going on here? But David chooses to number the people. And Joab says to him, don't do this. You know you don't need to do this. You know this will be wrong if you do this. Joab was a man that knew the Lord, even though he was kind of a murderer. Um, he was a man that knew the Lord, and he was a man that understood the things of God, and, and he knew that this was sinful. Don't do this. David says, do it anyway. So Joab does it. He comes back and he says, here's the numbers. And immediately David's heart smote him. He should not have done that. Well, God regarded this faithlessness quite harshly, and he gave David a choice of consequences. We'll talk about those consequences when we get there. But in the end, what we find is that the people of Israel are plagued for three days because of David's sin. And the people suffer the consequences of David's sin in numbering the people. And it is with that account that we end 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is divided along this line of obedience and blessing, then disobedience and cursing. The timeline and emphasis of David's reign is clearly delineated along these lines of obedience and disobedience. While David obeyed, he found success, rest, and joy beyond measure. When David chose to disobey, he brought upon himself and his family and his kingdom very dark days. And this is the legacy of God's economy. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings cursing. Now, we're not always talking about physically, right? We talk about that. It's not, it's not that obedience is going to make you a millionaire and disobedience is going to make you a, a, a impoverished. For years, people operated under those assumptions that any homeless man had to have some great sin in his life. Any man who lost a child at a young age must have some great sin in his life. But we know that that's not how God works. And yet, as we consider spiritual blessing and spiritual cursing, as we consider the one's success and the success of, of those that, that are, are underneath the authority of, of a man, and we consider um, the failures of, of a man and, and those that are under his authority, it hinges upon, in God's economy, obedience and disobedience. Now, we spoke this morning about what it means to be a man after God's own heart. The legacy of David was that of obedience in 1 Samuel. The legacy of David until 2 Samuel 10 was that of obedience. But the legacy of David in 2 Samuel... 11 and following to 24 is consequences of his wrong decisions. His sin with Bathsheba and then murdering Uriah destroyed his family, damaged his kingdom. Now David found forgiveness with the Lord. He found it the first chapter after his sin. But he also had to suffer the consequences. The lesson of David's are lessons for us as well. We are in Christ. We are forgiven from our sins. We operate apart from the law, but we still have every capacity to sin. We talked about that this morning. And sin has consequences. God is gracious. God is merciful. God will always receive us back. God will always bring us back into fellowship. And, and God can take he can turn, make beauty for ashes. God can take the difficult and the wrong decisions that we've made and he can turn them into our best good. And yet, Romans 8 told us this morning to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
When David persisted in that spiritual mind, he found life and peace. When David took upon himself a carnal mind, when he began to sin, when he began to cover his sin with other sins, his carnal mind worked death in him and those he loved. So 2 Samuel, in many ways, is a cautionary tale. That even those who love God and know Him well can fall into sin and fall into its consequences. And while these consequences never led David out of the blessedness of a relationship with God, nor will yours, and it didn't lead him into physical death, the consequences were still great upon him and those that were under him, upon his family, upon his kingdom. So it is with us as believers. You know, God is so gracious. He has not dealt with us according to our sin. He has placed his wrath for sin upon Jesus Christ so that legally our sin is removed from us as far as the east is from the west. James 2 tells us, however, that faith without works is dead. Our works do matter. Hebrews 10 exhorts us to fear and trembling, knowing the judgment of God upon sin. 1 Corinthians 3 warns us of a day coming when we'll have a reckoning for our works. Romans 6 through 8, Galatians 5 and 6 remind us that even in this life we reap what we sow, right? And that sin works separation from God's fellowship and blessing, even in the hearts of those who are His children and heirs unto salvation. Now, within the scope of this book, as we approach it, th this will be the broad warning. But I trust that David's life will also be an example, an encouragement. An encouragement that when a man is doing right, that the Lord will lead him, the Lord will guide him, and that as we seek the Lord to lead us and guide us, we will find that spiritual rest and peace that we seek. And quite often, as many of us know, as we seek the Lord and we do what's right, as we keep a clear conscience with Him, and as we live according to the principles that God has given in His Word, that the spiritual blessing oftentimes boils over into physical rest and peace as well. And may that be an encouragement from, the da from David's life as we walk through the book of 2 Samuel. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you that as we consider David's life, we are considering not a perfect man, not a man that did everything right, and in fact did things that in many ways is abhorrent and yet we thank you for your faithfulness in the midst of it all. We pray that you would be honored with how we take the lessons from this book over the next many months and how we apply them to our lives. As we learn of the dangers of sin, of the blessings of obedience, as we learn of the capacity we have to be successful in Christ, as we learn how to be led of Christ, May we also learn how to trust you. And may we feverishly desire to obey you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.